This is a video tutorial on how to use Lattice Radiant to create an FPGA design with VHDL and then flash it onto your FPGA. The Radiant is going to be the tool that we're using for the remainder of the semester. It's going to allow us to write fairly complex VHDL code and then synthesize it into a bitstream that can run on the FPGA or it can be flashed onto the FPGA. And it will also provide some debugging tools that are really helpful. So it can generate schematics that describe the VHDL code we've created, and as well as do more deep timing analysis and so forth if that's necessary. Okay, so I've just opened up Radiant here, and so I'm gonna create a new project. And we go put in this new project wizard that pop up. And I've already got a default directory for where my Radiant files are stored. Uh, but you can put that wherever you'd like. And I'm gonna call this Angate demo. So just demonstrating uh, just for this lab, uh, the goal again is very much like the first lab we did with iStudio, just get an AND gate working, demonstrate that you can flash that all the way to the, you know, get a bitstream built, go all the way to FPGA and run it on the hardware. And once that's working, then we declare success for this. We can come back next week to build some bigger things. Okay, so we'll click next. You can rename your implementation if you want. There's not necessarily an advantage to doing that. Uh, here, if you've already written some VHDL code, you can add that here. Um, in this case, we're gonna create a new file from scratch. Now we have to specify a device to use. So Lattice makes a whole bunch of different chips and Radiant supports several of them. Um, in this case, we need the ICE40 UP. Uh, that's, that's the particular family, chip family we're using. Uh, we're using the UP5K. So make sure you select that. And then super important, make sure you select the SG48 package. So if you select the UWG30, when you go to actually assign the pins, that will be weird and none of it will work. So SG48, uh, in particular, that means it has 48 pins on the package of the chip. Uh, everything else you can leave the way it is and then hit next. You can pick a synthesis tool. We'll leave it with Lattice LSE, although if you want to use Simplify, you can do that as well. We click Finish, and it's going to create a new project for us. OK, at this point, we want to go ahead and create a new file. And so we'll right click on Input Files and Add New File. And we'll want a new VHDL file. And let's call this and gate. So you'll need to, you want to name the file, whatever you want to name your entity. Okay, so now we're just typing code here, VHDL code into this window in Radiant. So, so we'll need the IEEE library as we always do. That standard logic. 64.all. So this library includes basic fundamental types that we're going to use, like standard logic uh, in particular, that, that has values of 0 and 1 and so forth. And then we can declare our entity and gate. So this is again defining a box uh, that is called and gate, and it's going to have some ports. And let's call them A, B, and Y. So A is an input, and it's a standard logic. B is also an input, and it's also a standard logic. And Y is our output, and it too is standard logic. And no semicolon on the last one, and we will close our port list. Semicolon does go there, and then end the entity here. Okay, now this is just to find the entity, but it hasn't defined what actually goes inside this box. Right? This is this is the border of the box with all the input ports and output ports. Now we have to just define that behavior. So we can do that with the architecture, and you can call this the name of the architecture, whatever you want. I usually use synth for something that I'm actually gonna synthesize into hardware. If you had an architecture that was only for simulation, for example, you might use sim 
or you, you might have different names depending on different kind of architectures. Uh, synth is an architecture of AND gate. And then we'll begin and then end the architecture here. And don't forget your semicolon. Okay, so inside the architecture, we can define its behavior. So y is assigned the value of a and b. OK, and that is it. So we can go ahead and save the file. And I was lucky enough typing this in that I have zero errors and zero warnings. I bet if, for example, you forget a semicolon and you save it, then it will automatically attempt to analyze the file and point out your errors there. So we have an unexpected end of file at line 17 here. We were expecting a semicolon and didn't find it. Okay. So now we've created our file and we are ready to try to synthesize this onto the FPGA. So first thing we'll want to do is click synthesize here. Note that there's four steps. So there's synthesize, there's map design, place and route, and then export files. And We'll have to do all of those. Uh, you can click just the green play button here to run them all. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna step through them one at a time just to show you what they do. So after I've synthesized, I can look at the net list to actually see what circuit I built. And I encourage you to do this um, on a regular basis just to get an intuitive sense of when I'm writing VHDL code, like what circuit is it actually building? So if we open up the netlist, in fact, we have A and B, there's an AND gate, and Y is the output. Um, so this is often a good sanity check. If you think you've built a particular circuit, sometimes that's very obvious on the netlist analyzer, whether you've succeeded in doing that or not. Um, or in particular, if you have designed some circuit and you look at the netlist and some huge chunk of something is missing, um, then that's often a clue that you, know, you, you did something simple wrong in your logic that a whole bunch of it is getting optimized out. Okay, we can close, we don't have to look at the netlist, um, but, but that option is always there as soon as you've synthesized. Because now we can map the design. So in synthesis, it's taking our VHDL code and figuring out what kind of circuit the, our code represents or our code is specifying. But of course, the FPGA doesn't actually have AND gates, it has lookup tables. And so map is going to take our circuit and map it into the, the stuff that the FPGA actually has. So mapping, mapping AND gates into lookup tables and so forth. Then we can run place and route. Um, so place and route is going to say, okay, you wanted this design and it's got a bunch of lookup tables. Which specific lookup tables on the chip are we gonna run? Or are we gonna use? in order to implement that, and how do we wire up the interconnections? Um, this is actually a very computationally difficult problem. And so for our simple AND gate, it will happen pretty quickly. But as you build more and more complex designs, you should expect that this will take easily 15, 30 seconds or, or a couple minutes. Uh, for large FPGAs and large designs, it is not uncommon for this to take hours. So if you're used to your code compiling instantaneously, um, this, is, this is just a much harder problem uh, in terms of computational complexity. It's very much MP hard. And if you could figure out how to speed it up, you could totally go get a PhD uh, for that. Okay, so once we've done place and route, uh, then we can export the file. So we've actually got a design and now it just has to save that into the bitstream format that's necessary for the FPGA. Okay, so we're all done, except that we never actually specified what pin numbers A and B and Y should be using. And so that's gonna be a problem. If we just flash it onto the FPGA, it's not clear what, uh, like what, what pins that's gonna use, if any at all. So let's go back and do that. So here is the device constraint editor. So this is going to show us a picture of the device itself. This is the um, all the input and output pins on the chip. So again, there's 48 of those because this is the SG48 package. And if you pick the wrong package, the, the UW30 package, this will look completely different. And that, that's your hint that you did something wrong. 
Okay, and then over here, we've got our inputs and our outputs, and we can specify what pins they're on. Uh, and nothing has been specified here in particular. So, so let's pick, for example, 28 and 38. So these, these pin numbers are the same as the pin numbers on the silk screen um, on the Arduino. So pin 28 here and pin 38 next to it. And then for our output, let's use pin 35. Of course, you can use whatever pin numbers you happen to want, but whatever works for something you've already built on your circuit board. Okay, once we're done, we have to save this. So the little star here, um, meaning we haven't saved it, and if you just go flash your design at this point, it's not gonna work. So we'll save that. And then notice that that has invalidated the mapping, place, and route, and export process. So after you change these pin assignments, we have to go rerun. The synthesis hasn't changed. The, the design that we specified is, no, is the same as it was before. It's no different. But everything else here in this design flow has been changed. So let's go ahead and rerun that. And we'll wait for just a minute for it to finish. Finally, it's creating the bitmap that will, is what will actually flash into the FPGA. And it says done, we're completed successfully. Okay, one more thing before we go actually flash our design into the FPGA. It's often useful to go look at the reports. This will tell you things about how fast your design can run and how much, how many of the LUTs in the, design, in the device you're actually using and so forth. Uh, so resource usage down here, uh, there are is one lookup table that we used, which makes sense. We just have one AND gate, so should only need one lookup table to implement that. Uh, I.O. buffers, so this is the number of input and output pins that are being used. Again, we have two input pins and one output pin, so that makes perfect sense. Uh, there's no timing errors here, and so that's all the most of the useful information here. If you want to drill down into some of these more detailed reports, you can see a lot, lot more information um, about all the different resources on the chip and exactly how many you're using and so forth. Uh, there's also detailed timing analysis. You can find out exactly uh, what the delay on the critical paths were and so forth. Uh, but we'll get into more of that later in the course. Okay, so we've created a bitstream. We've, we're ready to actually flash this on the FPGA. And Radiant has a programmer built in, uh, but it turns out it doesn't work on Linux. And so if you're using, if you have it installed locally on Linux or if you're using the virtual machine, We'll have a different way. Uh, and actually, I think it's probably a better way. The, the programmer built into Radiant is not awesome. Uh, if you are on Windows or you've installed it locally, then you can go ahead and just use the Radiant programmer if you'd like. Okay, so we're going to open up a terminal window here. And and we're going to go into the directory where I'm working on this project. So. That is in this directory here. Uh, so you can you can right click on right click on the project, go to properties, and then just copy what that location is. If you don't remember it off the top of your head. Okay, then let's look what's in here. So uh, inside, there's some files just here. This is the RDF file is the project file for Radiant. Um, and if I look in source. And input one. So here's my angate.vhd file that I created. Impl1.ldc and impl1.pdc are the constraint files for the pins. So we can look at that real quick. So this is just defining that port A is connected to pin 28, port B is connected to pin 38, and so forth. Okay, so those are our sources. And if we go into impl1 in this top level directory, uh, we know there's a whole bunch of files here. And one of them 
should be called and get demo one demo impl one dot bin. Uh, that is our bit file. So that's right here. And of course, if you can't find the whole name, you can do ls star dot bin, and that should show you. Okay, so now we're going to use ice prog. Uh, so this is actually what uh, Ice Studio is using under the hood to do this, and it, it works pretty well. So the ice prog and get demo one demo input one dot bin. Again, you can hit tab to autocomplete uh, if you're running on Linux, and that's really convenient. Then you should get this init, reset, flash, erase programming um, as it goes. Through. And then if you get verify OK, then it's complete, and then it will tell you that it's done. Um, and again, the same, the same basic USB debugging steps that were applied to iStudio apply here. So if you're not able to find it, um, doing LSUSB is a good way to check that it's actually connected to the virtual machine and go debug it in VirtualBox and, and so forth. At this point, you can go ahead and play with your circuit and confirm that we really do have a working AND gate. And if so, then you're all set for this lab and ready to move on to bigger and better things next week. Good luck.